Amen and amen and amen. Hey, church, this one time when I was in Israel, I went to the tomb. I have been to the tomb, and I am here as a firsthand eyewitness that the, the stone has been rolled away and that the tomb is empty and that he is alive. He is not here. He is risen. You can go to tombs of religious leaders all over the world throughout human history, and the one thing that they have in common is there's a dead man in there. But in the tomb of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I've got really good news for all of us. The tomb is empty because he is arisen, he is alive. Amen, church? Amen. <clears throat> and we are here today to celebrate that on Resurrection Sunday. And the key question, it's only the most important question that you'll ever deal with in all of your own eternity is this. Do you believe? Do you believe? Now, I know some of you believe like crazy. I mean, you know, you, you went to Sunday school with Moses, and this is like your 2000th Easter, and we were so glad that you were here, right? And so, praise the Lord. You showed up here today just ready to worship and praise our risen Savior. But I, I also know this. Some of you show up today, and, you, man, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, you think you believe. You kind of believe in God and that kind of stuff. But you would say, I don't know. I don't really think about it. Usually I'm reading the paper right now or whatever. But Nana said that she won't feed me today if I don't go to church. And so here's my annual visit. Hey, listen, of all the Sundays to be here, this is the day to be here. Because this is when we talk about the main event, the main thing. And I've got really, really good news for you. That what we're going to see in the scripture that we study today is this. No matter where you are or who you are or what you've done is that Jesus will meet you right where you are. And so if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, we're going to be in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you don't own a Bible, then uh, you can grab one in the seat back in front of you. That's our gift to you. Feel free to take that one home if, if you need a Bible. Maybe you have a Bible at home, but it looks like Shakespeare right, wrote it, right? The thee before thy, except after thou, and you can't understand it. Me either. So you have an ESV right there in front of you. It's written in a translation, hopefully, that you can understand. And, and we're beginning a brand new series over the next 10 weeks. We're going to talk about miracles, we're going to talk about miracles. What happens when the unexplainable runs into the undeniable? And the reason that we're starting with this one on Easter is because this is the greatest miracle of all time. This is the miracle of all miracles. And the truth is this, is that if Jesus came out of the grave, if the tomb is empty, then anything's possible. Then that means he could walk on water and change water to wine and, and heal people. And it also means if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible in your life too. And that Jesus, this day, could meet you right where you are. So we're going to pick it up in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. If you're new to Bible study with us, then uh, I just teach verse by verse through the Bible. It's a whole lot of what God said, very little of what I think, because you'll see that I don't really have that good of thought anyway. So John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1 says, Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, let me just, if you're new to Bible study, you're going to need to know this. There were 12 disciples. One of them was named John. And John had a nickname, and his nickname is the one whom Jesus loved. Now, the interesting thing is, the only place John is called that is in the book of John, written by John, okay, so. <clears throat> so Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, said to them, this is Mary saying to him, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. Now, can we just stop right here? Um, and, and you want to see, you want to see an example in not getting it? Mary has been following around Jesus for almost three years. She's heard him preach. She's heard him teach. She's seen him do miracles. And for the last several chapters uh, in the book of John and throughout all the Gospels, Jesus said over and over and over, uh, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priest. I'm going to be crucified, dead, buried, and on the third day be resurrected from the grave. So check this out. If you're a little slow on the uptake on this whole Jesus thing, I've got good news for you. You could make a really great disciple. You see, because Mary, on Easter Sunday, doesn't get it. She doesn't know what's happening. She thinks somebody has stolen the body. Verse 3. So, Peter went out with the other disciple. And again, the other disciple is John talking about himself. So, Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. And both of them were running together. John wants you to know, this is very important, that when Peter and John left from wherever they were, that they went together, that John did not get a head start, that they were running together, okay? Both of them were running together, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter 
and reach the tomb first. <laughs> John wants you to know that not only does Jesus like him a little bit better than all the rest of us, but also in a foot race that John can outrun Peter. Now, we know Peter's the Pope and he's the rock, but he runs like one because John says, I can outrun him. It's pretty important. So they go out together and, and, and they run together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Verse 5. And stooping to look in, he, that's John, John saw the linen cloths there, but he didn't go in. So he may be faster, but he's not braver. He's like, I am not walking up into a tomb, all right? So he gets there, and, and really, when we were in Israel a few weeks ago, and I will go and show you this if you'll go to Israel with me over the next few years, you can go to the garden tomb. That's where that video was. It's the tomb where they laid Jesus' body. And there are tombs all over Israel, all over the landscape of Israel. And rich people would carve out the side of a mountain and they would create basically this little cave. And the Bible says that the tomb in which Jesus was laid was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, a rich man's tomb. And because he was a rich man, he carved out kind of two rooms. And one room in there was a weeping or a wailing room where family would go in and they would sit and they would mourn and they would just kind of look at the body. And also, in most of the tombs that we visited, they were kind of built like catacombs. There were multiple, like six or eight, um, little square, rectangular holes carved out. And they would wrap a dead body in cloth linen, about 100 to 150 pounds of cloth linen and spices. And the reason they would wrap them in the spices is because they would take these bodies and they would put them into that tomb. And then they would roll a, a stone in front of it and let the body decompose over time. And so they were trying to keep the odor down with the spices and the stone. And then they would come back when the body was decomposed and they would take the bones of the body and they would collect the bones and they would put it in a bone box and then they would put that box there. So like if you wanted to go visit Nana, you could go see your bones at the graveyard. That's just kind of how it worked. But Joseph's tomb was a little bit different because he was a rich man. He had a rich man's tomb. And so he didn't have these little like cave things to put the bodies in. He had carved out, you can see it in the video, he had carved out three places whereby you could lay bodies. And there was a, a preparation place in the middle. And because Jesus, I mean, because Joseph volunteers up his tomb, it's not altogether complete yet when Jesus is laid in there. So the, the, the place that you would lay a body just adjacent to the door, that one's not finished. And the one uh, perpendicular to the door is not finished. But the one that was finished where they would lay Jesus' body, if you go up and you would kneel down to like three foot whole entrance and you look catty corner across and you could see where Jesus' body would have been. And so when they go and they kneel down and they look and they say, but the body wasn't there, but the linen cloths, they're just, they're just lying there. So stoop, stooping down to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Verse 6. And then <clears throat> Simon Peter came, comma, following him. Why? Because John is faster. And for the second time now, just in case you missed the first one. Remember, John wants you to know, we left together, but I got there first. And then a little later, Peter comes tagging along. So Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Now the details here are important. The Lord is not going to waste any words with us in the scriptures. And so again, there'd be about 100 to 150 pounds of linen cloths and spices and they're laying there and then next to it is this folded up face cloth. Now my grandma used to always tell me this is why you make your bed. She's like, look, if Jesus can be dead for three days and get up and make his bed, then surely you can make your bed. Okay, so I don't think that's what that means, but that's what she thinks it means and I'm not going to tell her. All right, And so um, here, here's why some of the details are important. This is evidence that the body was not stolen. I don't know if you've stolen anything ever. I'd be careful. The sheriff's right here on the front row. We'll talk about him in a minute. But uh, I don't know if you've ever stolen. I will tell you this. If you haven't stolen something, you're probably sitting next to somebody who has. Okay, welcome to 1122. Every week I meet people that come up to me and be like, man, I used to rob this place blind. Now I met Jesus here, all right? So we're a movement for all people. <laughs> but typically when you steal something, you're in a hurry. You don't stop to fold up the crime scene so it's nice and tidy for when the police get there. You understand? You just scoop and score. But when Jesus is resurrected, he is, uh, he's not in a hurry. He gets up and he folds up the linen cloth and he lays it aside. Now, here's why. A lot of theologians say there's this Jewish tradition where, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of people eating in the first century, but it doesn't look like Da Vinci's Last Supper at all. All right? It's not like a scoring table with all the judges sitting on one side waiting on the photo. That's not how it worked. They would kind of lounge around all over. And if you had to excuse yourself but you were finished, you would take your linen napkin and you would put it over your plate. And the reason you would crumple up and lay it there is to alert the servant that they can clean your area up because you're not coming back. 
But if you were going to excuse yourself, but you wanted to alert the servant that you're not done and that you're coming back, then you would fold up your napkin and you would leave it there to let him know, I may not be here right now, but I'm not finished. I'm going to be back. And so every Jewish person that read this, and particularly these young men that saw this, they knew that Jesus isn't here, but he's not finished, that he's going to be back. And so the other disciple, well, it says that they, they say this, they see it folded up in a place by itself, verse 8, and then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. <laughs> okay, can we just take a time out here? You can't scoot by this stuff in your Bible it's too quickly, people, okay? You understand? John would want you to know. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Scriptures, preserved by Almighty God for all generations to pro be proclaimed on the greatest day of the greatest miracle of all time, that God becomes flesh and he dies on the cross for our sin and he resurrects on the third day to conquer sin and death. John would want you to know, not just one time, not just to who, but three times, he would have us know that he can outrun Peter. <clears throat> Here's why I point this out. It's like John can't even get out of his own way here, right? On the greatest day in human history, he's still got to know, yeah, 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 Jesus came back from the grave, but I'm kind of quick. Here's what I know. Do you know, we all bring ourselves to Easter Sunday. We all bring ourselves to the resurrected Jesus. We all bring us with all of our insecurities and our pride and our arrogance and our doubts and, and, and our anxiety. We bring us to Jesus. And the good news is, is he will meet you right where you are. Because some of you lied your face off to our ushers when they handed you a bulletin. Because you fought the whole way here. It's just a fact. Don't elbow her. Just look up here at me. It's just true. And there ain't no fight like a good old Easter Sunday morning fight with your wife, right? You're waiting in the swagger wagon and be like, come on, woman. Jesus is going to return before we get to church. And then you just, rah, 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 rah. and then you get up here and people are like, hey, how you doing this morning? We just blessed and highly favored. All right, you liars. <laughs> and you bring all that in here. And the great news is, is that Jesus meets us right in our own humanity. With all our defenses and all our doubts and all our unanswered questions. That Jesus meets us right where we are. And what if, what if today you could have the same kind of experience that John and Peter have? And what if, even if you got a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of doubts, and when I ask, do you believe, you're like, man, I don't know. It seems complicated. What if you came to a tomb and the body was not in there, but he was alive? And then you came face to face with Jesus. And he said to you, I am who I say I am. And I'm not answering any of your questions. Would you believe? You see, that's what happened right here. The other disciple who reached the tomb first, he also went in and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. You see, as a Bible teacher, for me, it's a little bit unfortunate that the Greek word here, pastuo, gets translated believe. The Greek word is pastuo. It means to believe, to trust, to commit your whole life into. And so for most people in Jacksonville, if I say, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? They're like, yeah, man, I believe. Because, you know, a lot of us grew up around here. We're from the South. We believe in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and college football and NASCAR and Jesus. I mean, that's just kind of what we do. And we think believe that. This word pastuo means believe in. The best way I know to illustrate it is this. I believe that there is a college football team down in Gainesville. I believe that they exist. I have seen evidence of their existence here. Uh, I have seen their colors I, have seen, I, 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 in fact, know people that used to be on that team, okay? So I believe that there is a team down there. But I do not believe in said team, okay? I'm not wearing the colors. My arms don't do that thing. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And I know some of you do. Okay, that's fine. That's all right. We're a movement for all people, all right? Now, when I open my Bible, I just see red and black. But that's a totally different <laughs> message. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time, all right? You see the difference in believing that and believing in? Like, I'm not supporting them. I'm not doing that. And so when the Bible here says they saw and believed, it just doesn't mean believe that. It means believe in, trust in, pistuo in. Or like this, I know without a shadow of a doubt that you believe in the chair that you're sitting in, that you pistuo in the chair that you're sitting in. And you know how I know it? Because you're sitting in the chair. And I have no idea what you believe about the chair. 
I don't know if you know who created the chair. I don't know if you know who placed the chair. I don't know if you know who sat in the chair before you. I don't even know what you believe about it. I don't know if you know the engineering behind it and how it holds you up. I don't know what you believe about the materials that made the chair. And I doubt very many of you called somebody from the previous service to say, can you talk to me about the faithfulness of this chair? Is it going to hold me up? But here's what I know. At some point in this service, just a little while ago, you put your faith in the chair. You said, all right, here we go. And for some of us, it takes more faith than others, if you know what I mean. You're like, oh, boy. <laughs> All right. But you put the full weight of who you are onto the chair, and you trusted that it would hold you up. That's what these men did. They saw and believed. So my question is, do you believe with that kind of belief? Verse 9. For as yet, they didn't understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. Listen, I've got something that you please can't miss here, okay? Did you know that you could fully believe without fully understanding? You could fully believe in Jesus, trust Jesus, surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, become a Christian, go to heaven when you die, experience eternal life. You could fully believe in Jesus without fully understanding Jesus. Look, there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. I mean, there's a lot. I I can remember it kind of came to a head one time when I was in high school. Uh, we had this German foreign exchange student come to our high school. And, and, and so I always felt like a part of my ministry early on, it wasn't a very good idea, but, but I thought it was, was to lead cute girls to Jesus, you know, because I thought <laughs> Jesus loves everybody, we might, you know, and it's, it's, it's easier to become a Christian than to become cute. So you, you see where I'm going. And so, so I invited her to go to dinner. I'm sure it was real nice. I was 17 years old, probably had a coupon. And so there we are, right? And so she has zero background in Christianity. I mean, she knows nothing. She'd heard of the Bible. She'd heard of Jesus a little bit. But she had no idea between like Old Testament, New Testament, and God's love and any of that. And so she says, she's a pretty smart girl, and she says, so just tell me, so what do you believe? And I remember as I was explaining it, I felt like a crazy man. Now, I have a lot more detail and understanding now than I did when I was 17. But I remember saying, okay, all right, so, um, so there's God, and he's been around forever. And then he just, just, I don't know, got bored, so he made some stuff, all right? And he made the earth, and he put people on it. And she was like, what about the rest of everything? She's like, I don't know about that. So, and on the earth, and there's these two naked people, and then there's a snake, and then they're out of the garden. And then there's Abraham, and he didn't have kids. He was like a hunter, and that was weird. And then God told him to kill his son, but he didn't. And then there was a ram, and then Moses, and then uh, let my people go, and they go through the Red Sea. And then they're out in the desert, and they can't find the, where they're going because they didn't ask their wives. And then they get up on the mountain, they get the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Then there's the Day of Atonement, and the goat, and stuff dies, and there's blood everywhere. And then Christmas comes, and there's Jesus, and then there's John the Baptist, and he baptizes Jesus, and a dove comes down, and then Jesus heals people and walks on water and water to wine and, and heal and all this sort of stuff. And then he, he dies on the cross, and it is finished. And then he tells us, he tells the disciples, go tell everybody. And so Paul went and told everybody, and the Jesus floated up to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. And then one day, he's coming back on a white horse. <laughs> and that's it. She's like, you believe that? Uh-huh. Want to come? That was it. (laughs) In my mind, I'm like, that just sounds like I should be medicated. That is crazy. (laughs) And yet, the anchor that I cannot get away from, even in those times when there are things that I don't understand, is this, is that on Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago, Jesus is alive. And if you tell me that you're going to die and then three days later come back from the dead, I'm with you. Regardless of what I understand or don't understand, okay? I'll drink your Kool-Aid. I'll wear your tennis shoes. I'll cut my hair funny. Whatever you want me to do. Why? Because if you can conquer sin and death, then I'm with you. And on that day, I know it's unbelievable, it's unexplainable, but it's undeniable. That Jesus came back from the grave. And so, if you have a hard time understanding, if you're a little slow on the uptake on this whole Jesus thing, if you I don't know about this and that, and really dinosaurs and Noah and whatever, that'd be great. You know what? You can make a great disciple of Jesus Christ. Because the one thing that these boys did not understand is the linchpin of all of Christianity. That's the part they were missing. They didn't understand the resurrection. And without the resurrection, this is all just a fairy tale. And yet, they believed, they trusted, they surrendered their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Verse 11. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
Now listen, I don't think the angels are jacking around with her. I think the angels are legitimately confused because they're angels and they see the activities going on from a heavenly perspective. And I think they're like, woman, what is wrong with you? Why are you crying? You shouldn't be crying. This is the greatest day in human history. Don't you know that the lamb was slain for the forgiveness of your sin? Behold the lamb. He's not here. He's risen. Don't you read your Bible? Did you not pay attention in Sunday school and VBS? This was the point of the whole thing. Why are you crying? This is dumb. It's like crying on your birthday. It just doesn't make sense. Do you understand? I was in heaven a minute ago. They are partying like rock stars up there, okay? What is wrong with you, woman? Why are you crying? And the reason is because she doesn't understand. She doesn't get it yet. And they say, woman, why are you weeping? And she says to them, they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where where they laid him. And having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. You see, she's so consumed in her own sorrow that she doesn't even see Jesus. Let me just tell you. Can I tell you my greatest fear on this Easter Sunday and all of our locations and places? And look, we're going to have thousands of people here today. And my greatest fear is you'd be three feet away from Jesus and you wouldn't see him. Because you're so hung up and like where are you going to lunch or something going on in your own life. Or you've got this question that you need answered. And you could be like Mary face to face with Jesus and that you could, you could miss him. And so she's standing there and she thinks he's the gardener. And so she says they've taken away my Lord. And I, I don't know where they've laid him. And, and she turns around. She sees Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Verse 15. And Jesus said to her, woman. Why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, then tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Verse 16, and Jesus said to her, Mary? And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni. John says that means teacher. It also could be translated as precious teacher. You see, listen, it is not until Jesus calls Mary's name that Mary sees Jesus for who he really is. You know, if you've been to an Easter service before, can I just tell you, I'm probably not going to give you any new information today. Jesus died on the cross for your sin, resurrected on the third day. Some of you have probably heard that before. The night that I became a Christian, that I surrendered my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it was not because I received any new information. It was because I had a new revelation. And I felt like Jesus called my name. None of the information was new. I knew the whole Jesus dying on the cross thing. But somehow, in my heart of hearts, in a way that is unexplainable, but it's undeniable, I knew he called my name, and I saw him for who he is. And I know that Jesus is who he says he is, and he always keeps his promises. It is my hope and prayer that that today, that you would hear Jesus call your name. Go down to verse 19. And on the evening of that day, The first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. See, these men were afraid because they had just killed their leader. They were thinking, man, if they killed the leader, then they're coming after us next. And the crazy thing is this. The opposite of faith is not doubt. Again, as we see throughout this chapter, if you have a lot of doubts, then you can make a great disciple. Just put your faith in Jesus. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is fear because fear paralyzes and faith always produces action. And so they're all huddled up, and they're afraid, and they've got all the doors locked. And then it says, and Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Now, sometimes I think the Bible is a little understated, okay? These guys are freaking out. They'll be like, hey, Peter, did you lock the door? Uh Uh-huh, Bartholomew, did you lock that door? Yep, yep, yep. And then they're like, what are we going to do? And Peter and John were like, man, we went, and he wasn't there. And then Mary's like, I saw him, I saw him. Like, shut up, crazy lady. Go sit over there or pray or something. And that's what's going on. And then they look, and there's Jesus. And they were like, whoa. And Jesus, it, it, it translates, peace be with you. I think it's like, John, change your pants. All right, I think that's what it is. Because they don't expect him to just show up. And here's the reality. You know, some of you walk in here with all the doors locked and all the walls up. Be like, I ain't believing nothing, okay? I'm just going because I'm trying to get her to go out with me again. Well, whatever. When Jesus is ready to just be, you can resist him until he decides he's irresistible. And then my testimony is, I didn't go looking for him. He just walked up into my life and said, peace be with you. And he can walk through whatever barrier and barricade that we put up. And so he says, peace be with you, verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them. You might want to underline that. He breathed on them. And he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, 
As I was rereading this text again this year, listen, I've read this passage over and over and over. I'm a professional Christian, and this is what I do, okay? So I'm reading this again, and I see this little part he breathed on them. And I'm thinking, what, what is that all about? That seems kind of weird, doesn't it? I mean, you got to put yourself in the context here. you got to smell it. you got to be there. The guys are afraid. they got the doors locked. Boom, there's Jesus. And then they're like, how did you lock the door? And he's like, peace be with you. And then he says, and just blows on them. So let me just tell you, i got some friends here today. If you walked up to me at the end of the service, and would be like, hey, pastor, I hadn't seen you in three days. I'd be like, whoa, well, hey, 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 how you going to blow on a man's face like that, huh? You want to talk to somebody about what you're just going to blow on a man's face? I mean, this could be flu season. You understand? Get out of my face, right? What? Why are you blowing on me? And it doesn't say exactly how it happened. I don't know how he did. You got you to use your imagination. Not that it's a story, but it's a real event. Think about how it happened. I mean, is it like birthday cake style? They get them all together and be like, <gasps> is that, did he do it that way? See, I don't think so. I think, it doesn't say it, but I think he went one at a time. I mean, he's like, hey, what's up, Matthew? <laughs> Peter? <laughs> John? Love you. <laughs> I think that's what he did. <laughs> and you're like, it's still kind of weird. How's somebody just going to be blowing on people's faces? Well, here's why. Here's why I think. You see, what Jesus has just accomplished by his resurrection is that 2 Corinthians 5.21 will say it this way, that God made him who was without sin to be sin for us, that we would be made his righteousness. That, that Jesus is the substitutionary atoning sacrifice for our sin. Substitute means to take place of. Atonement means to pay for. That every single one of us are wretched, black-hearted sinners. That, that the heart of our problem is really we have a problem in our heart. That we have sinned against an almighty, holy, and just God, which requires an infinite punishment. And there's nothing that we could do on our own to make that payment. And then Jesus says, I'll make the payment. He goes to the cross, and, and on the cross, he pushes up on his nail-pierced feet, and he says, it is finished. And what is finished is the full payment required to take away our sin. But it gets even better than that. That the moment he says it is finished, an earthquake hits Jerusalem. And the temple is shaken. And there is a veil that separated the people from God from the presence of God. And that veil is ripped from the very top to the very bottom. So that we could be in a relationship with God. That we could be reconciled unto our heavenly Father. And to be reconciled means that the relationship could go back to what it was. Because if you go all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, when God created the very first human beings, the Bible says... In Genesis 2, 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. That word in, in Hebrew here for breathe is ruach. And the word ruach can mean breath or it can mean spirit. The Greek word is pneuma, and it can mean breath or spirit, like pneumonia. Pneuma means breath, and onia means it's messed up right now, I think. That's what it means, Okay. And the Bible wants us to know in detail that this is not a March Madness three-pointer where he goes, and it lands in there. But the Bible says that the almighty creator, maker of heaven and earth, who primarily wants to be known as Heavenly Father, that he got nostril to nostril with the very first man, Adam. And before this, he was alive, but he was not not in the image of God yet until God breathed the ruah of life into Adam. And Adam opens his eyes, and he is face to face with his creator that he knows as Heavenly Father. And listen, it goes exceedingly well for near a half a page here in the Bible. And then, man and woman sin. Sin enters the world. And that face to face relationship with God as Heavenly Father is forever fractured. And they are banished from the garden. And it's why every single one of us had this yearning, this desire in us to get back to that moment where you and I could be face to face with our creator and not just know him as judge, but know him as heavenly father. And so all throughout the Old Testament, they could not have a face to face relationship with God. In fact, Moses, you want to talk about a holy man. Can we not agree that Moses is a holy man? I mean, he jotted down the Ten Commandments and and went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. I mean, he's kind of a big deal. And in Exodus 33, he says, God, show me your glory. And God's like, bro, you can't handle my glory. I'll burn you up like a potato chip, okay? So I'll take you, put you over here in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to pass by, and you can check out the afterglow. Very loose translation, but you should read your Bible. It's in there, Exodus 33. But then when Jesus comes, and he dies on the cross and says, it is finished. It counts for you. And he's resurrected on the third day. And then he shows up to his boys in this room who believe. And he goes, hey, receive the ruah of life. 
why don't we start over with this face-to-face relationship with your heavenly father. You see, that's what he's doing in that room. That's what he wants to do with you right now. You see, one of the neat things about being the pastor of this place is I get to meet all kind of people, okay? Like the sheriff, and I know the sheriff now. I use, I've known many sheriffs, but this is a much different relationship than my previous relationships with sheriffs. That's great. <laughs> and so we got to know each other a little bit during the campaign, praying for him, that kind of stuff. We've gotten to know each other. And, and our church and JSO are partnering together for jobs initiatives. I mean, it's really cool. Just we all love the city and want it to be better, right? And so in one of our meetings, the sheriff is telling me, he's like, man, you got to hear this story. And he starts telling me this man's story. And I'm like, that's the greatest story I've ever heard in my life. Can I meet this guy? And here's how I wanted to, here's why I wanted to meet him, okay? Because I, I know some police officers. My brother's a police officer. And if you're a police officer, we love you. You've always got a friend here at the Church of 1122. And you are the best storytellers we've ever heard. But sometimes we want to check out the details, you know what I'm saying? Because, you, you know, you never let the truth get in the way of a really good story, right? My brother starts off, everyone like, there I was, you know, in the car chase. I'm like, I think that's rush hour. But anyway... <laughs> So I just wanted to check out the story. So then I meet this guy, this former officer, and he's got this story. And I'm thinking, man, that day, what? And so I thought instead of me just rehashing the story, you could hear it from the man himself. And so we, we put it into a short film. And so I would, like to, I would like for you to see the most amazing modern-day picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Check this out. For some reason, we don't know why, he produced a firearm, stood up and started shooting. Police arrested a suspect today accused of murdering two men during an apparent robbery. One of the men murdered was 21-year-old Isaac Brown Jr., the son of a police officer. The younger Brown was in the right place, but at the wrong time. Tokoya Kreiner was arrested and convicted of killing Brown and a friend and wounding another man. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. My name is Ike. It's Isaac. But, you know, everybody called me Ike. Uh, and a buddy of mine was taking a police exam and he said hey let's go take the test so I figured I would you know lo and behold next thing you know I was picking up a uniform <laughs> you know and that was early 86 I was previously married mm -hmm. I had two kids by that union and uh, uh, after 14 years I got divorced uh, the Lord blessed me to meet my current wife now uh, it was Gina We've been together about 25 years. Uh, we have three kids together, you know, a son and two daughters, and uh, I have a stepdaughter, and we have uh, three great-grandchildren. Uh, not great-grand, but great-grandchildren. <laughs> My firstborn, uh, we have the same name. He's Isaac Jr. Uh, he loves sports, you know, football and basketball. I think basketball was his number one love. He was a comedian. Like, he didn't meet a stranger. He was just so funny. We had so many memories, like, when we were younger. He was like the class clown. Like, everybody loved him. He just was very comical. So people just liked his personality. The beauty of, of Isaac is I've always said, you know, I never, you know, as he grew up, you know, got a call in the night of him being in trouble, of, you know, no call for no parent, of, you know, you mistreated my daughter, and, you know, he was just always a, a good, mannerable, you know, young man, you know, and uh, very proud to have had 21 great years, you know, 21 years. Police say it all happened here on Town Square Drive. Three friends were playing video games at the home of one of their girlfriends. 
Another man was there too, police say. He's now charged with two counts of murder. Police say it looks like the two men that were killed, 21-year-old Ike Brown Jr. and 21-year-old Jeffrey Hicks, didn't know their killer all that well. These fellas don't have any connection to our, our shooter. They don't have any connection to anybody except Gavin Berry, who they were visiting. And that's why I'm making that, that, that point, is that, you know, it just seems to be that they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mr. Mayor, how many gunshots do you think you heard? At least seven. Gavin Berry yeah, describes what it was like seeing his two best friends shot to death in his home back in May 2002. Prosecutors say this man, Takoya Kreiner, pulled the trigger. He was sitting in the back portion of this room armed with a 380 caliber firearm. Jeffrey Hicks, Isaac Brown Jr., and Barry played video games. Kreiner sat back. They say he pulled out a gun and started shooting. Gavin Barry will tell you the next thing he knows is pop, 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 pop. All successive gunfire in rapid succession. Hicks and Brown's family sat in the front row of the courtroom listening to every word. Brown's father, a Jacksonville Sheriff's officer, left when graphic details of the murder scene were played out. Early that morning, the doorbell rang, you know, and I'm like, man, who can this be, you know? And when I opened the door, my chief was standing there. And believe it or not, that didn't really surprise me. And then my sergeant was there, you know, and I'm like, man. And then my lieutenant, you know, they all were there together. And still nothing clicked, but behind my lieutenant, I saw the chaplain. I saw the police chaplain, Chaplain Crosby. And when I saw him, <laughs> I knew something was wrong. And I think the first thing I said was, hey, Chaplain Crosby, why are you here? He didn't say anything at the time. My sergeant spoke first. And he told me, he said, he said, Ike, I got to tell you, you know, that uh, your son Isaac Jr. was killed. And uh, that pretty much did it there, you know, that, that, that pretty much broke me down and it's kind of unbelievable, you know, what, what do you do, you know, what do, what do you do, you know, uh, pretty helpless, pretty helpless feelings. said if you, you know, hurt one of my children, one of my family members, you know, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. you know, I'm gonna get you, you know, I'm hate you. I supposed to hate you, you know. I, I convinced myself, you know, God want me to get you. You know, this this my child, you know, and and uh, of course I get there and you know he comes out and I'm seeing him for the first time. I loved him. Didn't know him, never seen him before. You know, didn't know his family, didn't know his background, but I loved him. And I still can't explain it, you know. Uh, I didn't have the feelings I thought I was gonna have. I know for sure now it was God's love, you know, God's grace, and, and, and later I would say to myself, you know, wow, maybe he is doing something in me that I didn't even know was, was taking place, you know because I question myself, what's wrong with me? You know, what's wrong with me? Why don't I feel this way? Why don't I, you know, why don't I feel the way I, I thought I would feel? But through all my whys and, and wondering, I still, you know, trusted that, hey, God was in control and I just forgave him. Channel 4 cameras are rolling when emotions from inside the courtroom spill out into the hallway after a jury finds Takoya Kreiner guilty of first-degree murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. Kreiner's family so stricken with emotion, they can hardly stand. Brown's father, who was a Jacksonville Sheriff's officer, was in the courtroom every day. 
I'm just glad the week is over. Glad it's over. And I can find some peace. After Takoya was sentenced and he went off to prison, uh, I always kept him in my prayers, you know, and uh, wonder, you know, how's it going? You know, what is he doing? You know, how is he surviving? You know, and so I wanted to talk to him. So I would write letters and I'd throw them away. You know, you, know, you don't want to hear from me. You know, what will he say? You know, he, you know, I don't want to hear from you. I'm doing three life sentences, you know. And so all this is going through my mind. So I would never mail them. You know, and uh, and one day I decided, you know, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a letter and I'm gonna send it to him. And I did just that, you know. And in that letter, I, you know, I I said hello, you know, this is Mr. Brown. I said uh, I hope things are as well as they can be, you know. I, I hope all is well, and and uh, I let him know that, you know, he was always in my prayers, and, and uh, I'd always be, you know, mindful of him and thinking of him, and. Uh, at the end of the letter, I said, I need to ask you for a favor. I said, I miss my son, Ike Jr. And I said, uh, I'd like you to fill in for him till we all get to heaven. You know, we can write, we can laugh, we can talk. You know, and I said, and if not, I understand. And I, I mailed the letter off, you know. And, and it took about three weeks to a month, you know, to get a response back, you know. And, and I get a letter. And I'm scared to open it, <laughs> you know, because I don't know what it's going to say. I don't know, you know, if you're cursing me out, leave me alone. I don't want to hear from you, you know. And, and uh, so I opened that letter, and it said, Dear Mr. Brown, you know, I now know that God is real. And I told God that if I heard from you, I would give my life to him the rest of my days. And uh, he was sharing this with me, and he said, Mr. Brown, you asked me, for a favor, you ask me, can I fill in for you know Ike Jr. And he said, I'm not qualified, but if you'll have me from this point on, you're my dad and I'm your son. Corey Kreiner, and um, I'm currently serving a life imposed sentence. This man, Mr. Brown, that I had come to know and grew to love, and to now call, you know, my dad, my father. You know, God has such such a greater plan. We're just parts and characters in the, in the role. This was an opportunity, you know. Um, God was using me and him as vessels, you know, to, to not just show, you know, people that was around or, you know, close to or familiar with our, our relationship or our situation, but the world, what love was, you know, what love truly was, you know, some of the divine attributes of love. At first, it was, it was, it was strange. And, you know, over time, I was able to, you know, realize, you know, this is beautiful. And I learned to embrace it more and more. And that love that I began to have grew more and more for my dad. And I was just waiting for this opportunity to, uh, to be in his presence, to see and feel it. And when I was given the opportunity to see him for the first time and, um, back in 2009, he ran up on me and he wrapped me up in the bear hug. I didn't know what to expect. I was like, whoa, here it go. <laughs> but I seen him, I didn't know what to expect. You know what I mean? I, I really didn't. I, did, I, I didn't because I was waiting for this opportunity. And when he ran up on me, I was in shackles and chains, you know. I didn't know what to expect. You know, he ran up on me, he wrapped me in the bear hug, told me he loved me, squeezed me tight, you know. And it just felt, it felt good, man. It, it felt real good. I knew, that's when I knew it was genuine, for real. We as, you know, just flesh and blood, mortal beings, we're given a lot of things that we don't deserve. 
And that's what grace is. It was a beautiful thing. And this is why, you know, I, I embraced it. I embraced this opportunity. Christ died for us. Uh, through all of our mistakes, through all of our faults, he forgives us. It's just as simple as asking, you know. He won't find you. You know, he won't hold it against you. You know, he won't, he won't hold your mistakes against you. Just ask for forgiveness. Believe God. I know it looks bad, you know. I know you're struggling, you see no way out. But I'm telling you, if you would trust him, I just tell you to trust God, no matter what. Trust God. church right here on the first on the front row is Ike Brown and his family can we just welcome them to the church of 1122 amen you can be seated listen that's the gospel that is the gospel if God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, and our sin murdered the son of God. And yet, because of the riches of his grace, God Almighty decides to adopt his son's murderers as his very own sons and daughters of the Most High King. Listen, that's, it's unbelievable, but it's undeniable. It is a miracle. And if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. And let me tell you what's going to happen. All week long, in your mind, you're going to be thinking, I don't know if I could do that. I don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. How in the world? You see, not only does Jesus meet us in our sorrows and meet us in our fear and meet us in our humanity, he also meets us in our doubts. You see, the way chapter 20 ends is this, is Thomas wasn't there when Jesus showed up the first time. And for eight days, Thomas is like, man, I don't know. I mean, I hear what y'all say. I hear that it happened for you, and that was real for you. But for me, I got to see it myself. I don't, I don't think I could. I don't know, man. And you know, what, you know what Jesus does? Jesus does not chastise Thomas for his doubts. He just proves himself, even in the midst of the doubts of Thomas. He shows up in that room again, and he proves himself. He shows Thomas the scars on his hand and on his feet and in his side. And he goes, see, Thomas? I am who I say I am, and I always keep my promises. And then in verse 28, and Thomas answered, after seeing it, Thomas answered, my Lord, my God. That's the moment Thomas surrenders his life to Jesus. That's the moment that he believes. And Jesus says to him, have you believed or have you trusted because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have pistuoed, who have believed, who have trusted. So let me ask you, do you believe? It finishes this way. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe or trust or pastuo that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So the million-dollar question is this. Do you believe? Mr. Brown said in the video, regardless of your circumstances, when you don't understand, you trust God. So do you trust God? Do you believe? Do you pastuo? Are you ready to put the full weight of your life onto the person and work of Jesus Christ? Not to try to somehow earn his love by what you do, but understand that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you believe? You see, God wants to offer you. You know, he's written us a love letter too. And it basically says something very similar to what Mr. Brown's letter says. I know, I know what your sin has done to my son, but I would like to adopt you as my own if you would just say yes. And the way that you say yes is to believe, is to trust God, to admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior, to believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that counted for even you and me, and to confess him as Lord and Savior. And the Bible says you'll be saved. 
And so that same invitation that Mr. Ike gave, that same invitation God gives us in this moment, that we could be adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High King. I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and bow your head and ask yourself this question. It's only the most important question that you'll ever deal with in all of eternity is, do you believe? Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that counted for you? Now, if you do, it doesn't mean that all your questions are necessarily answered, but that you could fully believe, even in this moment. And if that's you, if you're saying, I am ready to surrender my life to the Lordship of Christ, I am ready to have all of my sins washed away, and even better than that, I am ready to be adopted into the family of God as a son or a daughter of the Most High King, and I am ready for that face-to-face relationship with my Heavenly Father, then would you just let it be known by raising your hand. You lift it high in the air, and in your own words, deep in your own soul, you just say that to God. So God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that when Christ died on the cross, it counted for me. And God, right now, I choose to surrender to be a part of your family. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that we can love you because you first loved us. God, I thank you that you are a good, good Father. God, that is who you are. And that we are loved by you. God, that is who we are. And God, I thank you that Jesus paid the full price for our sin. That we could be in a right relationship with you. That we could know you, not just as God and King and Judge, but we could know you as our Heavenly Father. And God, we thank you that you run up on us. And you wrap us up in that bear hug. And some of us walk in going, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. But we know when that moment happens, God, it is good and it is beautiful. And God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. And we thank you for the empty tomb. And we pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.